Well, uh, yeah, it's working. Before it was a bit long. So uh, when, when I was looking at the CFP for, for plumbers and Colonel Summit, I was like thinking, well, I have a bit this reputation of doing highly critical talks. I need to find a topic to complain about. And, and the trouble is, uh, the, the things are going great in GraphX. So I, I think this is like the, 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 the much more honest title for this talk. Because if you look back like 10 years ago, uh, we, we, we merged Gem, the graphics execution manager of kind of managing rendering and graphics memory. We merged kernel mode setting roughly also about 10 years ago. Uh, we had like the Intel driver and the AMD driver. And also about 10 years ago, we were proudly celebrating achievement of OpenGL2, like five years behind the industry. <laughs> it was. It was pretty bad. Uh, and, and like, it was, was, was a bit of R&D project by like two companies and a few distros and, and that's it. And if you compare this to today, uh, uh, the graphics subsystem has grown uh, a lot. Like with about 10% of the kernel. Doesn't really matter whether you take lines of codes or commits or people or whatever. It's, it's, it's around that. Was about the uh, equal size again in user space for, for the GL drivers Vulcan. Uh, I counted just uh, last week, and apparently we have 50 mode setting, uh, atomic mode set drivers, so that's like the latest and greatest stuff. We have latest OpenGL almost, uh, the GLES for, for socks, we have Vulcan drivers, uh, and just one number that, that's kind of astonishing, at least to me. Uh, the smallest driver, and it's not, it's not just a component driver, it's, it's an actual DRM subsystem graphics driver that we have, it's about 250 lines. And I looked at it. it, it's an actual driver. You could maybe spend another 15 lines for suspend resume support on it. That, that's like one end, and on the other end we have over 2 million lines of code for the AMD thing, so, so, so we have like uh, four orders of magnitude between the smallest and the biggest. Uh, so it's, 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 it's really, the, the subsystem really started scaling. So I want to explain like how and why we achieved this. Uh, one thing is definitely the Atomic Mode Set API, which is a complete revamp we've done a few years ago of, of the kernel mode setting with a lot more support for planes to make the small SOCs happy and the super low power usages. Uh, better support for lots of ads, but uh, hardware blending, write back, uh, color space conversions for all the fancy new TVs and, and the high definition stuff. Uh, stuff like gracefully handling display port link failures, which apparently is a thing. We even have content protection. So it's, it's really, uh, uh, we, we have, uh, with Atomic, I, I really think we've, we've achieved the goal to have one display API kind of to rule them all. Um, a similar things on, on the rendering side. Uh, before uh, atomic mode setting, we uh, we essentially just had a, a hodgepodge of incompatible stuff without much sharing. Uh, we we now have a DMA buff kind of across driver buffer objects for zero copy buffer sharing. We have DMA reservations which handle access from drivers to make sure that. They're not all standing on top of each other, but uh, the, all, all the DMA access is nicely pipelined and nicely uh, synchronized. We have DMA fences to uh, track what, what the, uh, kind of the, the GPU is doing or anything else. And again, that's, that's kind of cross driver. You can just pass them around, uh, which is really nice for, for like some of the server workloads where you just plug in one GPU after the other until your box is full. Or for, for SSCs where you have lots of little small drivers, one for display, one for rendering, one for, for the camera. And they all need to work together. Um, we, we have this weight band mutex that we landed like almost 10 years ago, which, which is a fancy addition to plain kernel mutexes for graph locking problems. And apparently we have a lot of those in, in graphics drivers. Uh, we made a fancy new uh, 
synchronization object thingy of a Vulkan uh, for, for kind of a better user space API for fences. So uh, lots of great uh, cross-vendor uh, stuff there. Now, th this is kind of the, the, the interfaces, the cross-driver stuff. Uh, the other thing, and really that, that's kind of the story between the 250 line complete kernel driver is we have an enormous amount of, of helper libraries nowadays. So if you have a simple piece of hardware, essentially you write a few lines of code and then you just glue together your real driver with the helpers. Uh, so uh, if you look at that 250 line driver, essentially it's about a third include files and white space and curly braces, about a third of it is just uh, the V tables filling out the existing helpers that they still need it. And one third is just one function that lights up the panel because that's the one non-standard port. So uh, we have a really nice ho uh, modular helpers for the, the display side. So it's not just one block, but you can pick and choose the bits and pieces that you want, and again, all the others are right here on. Um, we have, on top of kind of the atomic stuff, because atomic, as I explained, is kind of rules the world. It's way too, too kind of powerful and featureful for, for simple uh, displays. We might just have one display, and, and it can do nothing else than like a small panel somewhere on a box, an embedded box. So for those, we have uh, uh, the simple display pipe helpers that just break all that complexity down to uh, like four callbacks or something like that, and they're all optional. Uh, we have helpers for all the, the output standards out there, display port, uh, MIPI is, is the standards for all the panels in, in, in tablets and phones, HDMI of course with, with all the slightly funny things that TV do and require EDID as kind of the metadata of the packet that most displays send back to you to tell you uh, what to do. Uh, we have helpers for uh, a lot of the power saving features that you use in, in, in kind of small panels and tablets. Uh, like if you just freeze the entire machine and just keep the display alive, well, that's, that's called self-refresh for display. Well, we have a nice pile of functions that you can just plug in and it's all taken care of. Or damage tracking, if you, if you just upload the, cursor, the blinking cursor, not always everything. Saves a lot of memory bandwidth and all the, all the power expense. And of course, we, we have like the old FBDF subsystem back 10 years ago when we merged kernel mode setting, a lot of people were, hey, so there's already this kernel mode setting thing in the FBDF subsystem. Why are you not using it? And uh, I think we've su superseded it now so well that uh, with one line in the FBDF emulation to kind of enable this and wire it up, you have a fully functioning uh, FBDF driver written in, in kind of the new atomic mode set infrastructure. I think some examples were like in four times fewer lines of code than the old thing, but roughly the same feature set. And we have more helpers. On the, on the rendering side, uh, we have a nice generic uh, GPU scheduler nowadays, like, like people are, are not too appreciative if their background compute job like makes the desktop freeze, uh, things like that. Uh, there's a, a lot of work going on around uh, TTM, which is the thing to manage kind of VRAM and things like that. Uh, making it a bit more modular so you can pick and choose. A lot of that has already been done, pulling out concepts and, and algorithms and locking, uh, uh, locking kind of algorithms and, and locking primitives. And again, uh, we, we have the subsystem that needs to scale by a factor of 10,000. So if we have like the fancy super, super complex helpers on one side, we also have the super simple helpers on the other side, so we can actually uh, write the driver in 200, uh, 250 lines of code. So we have helpers for uh, the simple displays that only have a little bit of VRAM and do nothing else, kind of, nowadays they're mostly found on servers. 
Uh, so that, that's kind of the last set of drivers that we need to take over from FBDF before we can sunset that. We have uh, 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 shared memory helpers, which is kind of the equivalent for simple display drivers on, on SOX. We have the CMA, DMA helpers for kind of the, the, the slightly less capable display blocks that, that need uh, contiguous DMA memory. And with everything, we, we've been trying really hard to, to make the batteries included everywhere by default. So you just write the driver and you get a reasonable default behavior of everything. So uh, things are working really great um, on, on the helper front. Then more awesome stuff. Uh, we've, uh, over the past 10 years, uh, with the SOCs, they're a lot more modular on x86. We kind of open, open source graphics drivers started out. You just get one GPU from AMD or Intel or whoever. Um, it, it contains everything and it's all vendor specific. You just smash, smash it in one driver and you're good. Uh, but on the SSC side, there's a lot more sharing of, of little IP blocks in, in, in the SSC going on. So we have bridge drivers that, that kind of uh, support transcoders. So the display block has an output and then there's a bridge driver which converts that output into something that an HDMI TV can understand. On um, similar, uh, for panels, because of all kind of this semi-smart power saving features, these panels uh, need quite a bit of control logic. And of course, every panel is different. Every, <laughs> every revision of a panel happens to be different. So we, we have, uh, I think, I honestly don't know, like a massive pile of, of panel drivers uh, that you can nicely can connect them with DT, and plug it all in so you have one driver and plug in the panel. Uh, and, and in general, uh, there's been a lot of work towards componentizing uh, the, the rather monolithic DRM approach to make it fit for SSCs. Um, we are, we are on, on track to fix uh, the hot unplug issues. So nowadays, if you plug out uh, a DP multi-stream like dock or something, that the machine doesn't freeze that often anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, the same thing with kind of USB docks and, and things like that. Uh, we, we, we're straightening out all the, all the reference counting madness there and all the bugs. Um, we've, we've also done like massive improvements in terms of self tests and, and uh, regression tests. So the past two years, we've added a lot of, of kind of in kernel regression tests in DRM just for the helpers like just mock a DRM driver, do a bunch of transactions and things and make sure the helper actually uh, follows the contract that we think it should follow. So big shout out to KUnit. We really wanna see this thing land so we, we, can, we can go away from duct tape to something slightly more structured. And on the user space side, kind of for, for the IOCTLs, with, especially on the mode set side with the atomic mode setting, lots more features, lots more potential that the drivers don't implement it the same way. So we're working to with uh, some nice cross vendor standards there. Um, then of course, like I said, graphics is like the same size again in user space. So there's a lots of awesome stuff going on in user space. Oh, one thing is, is the Gallium stack. This is, this is kind of a framework for writing a, a GL driver. Um, now also supported by Intel pretty soon after having been a, been a holdout, holdout for like almost 10 years. Um, then over the past 10 years for, for like a, the user space stack, you need a compiler for your shaders that run on the GPU. Uh, and, and we've had quite a, a bit of a, 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 a GPU compiler struggles with LLVM competing, uh, like two, three um, different kind of intermediate representations and their entire ball of optimization passes in, in the OpenGL and the Mesa 3D stack. And I, I think it's, it's now looking like that we're settling on the one true compiler stack to, to rule them all, at least on the back end side. 
I think for compute, oh, there's still going to be LLVM, like taking OpenCL kernels or whatever. Um, another thing is also uh, the, the reverse engineering tools that the NVIDIA reverse engineering people started over 10 years ago. Uh, they're really nice now. On some uh, driver engineers from teams that do open source from the hardware vendor side have been heard saying that they're better than their internal tools for managing uh, register sets and instruction encoding. And uh, also, so that, uh, uh, also really nice kind of for, for uh, moving kind of the user space side of the stack forward. Then uh, we have Kronos, which is the standards committee for OpenGL and or standards group for OpenGL and Vulkan and all these things. And Kronos has started opening up. There's now an open source test suite for Vulkan and GLES and significant chunks of, uh, of GL. And they, they kind of moving away from the very closed uh, industry group that, that GL has been uh, 10 plus years ago. Um, more great stuff in user space. Uh, we have a massive pile of reverse engineered drivers. Uh, Panthrust is for, for the modern or newer ARM Mali chips. Lima is, is for the first generation uh, uh, ARM Mali chips. Uh, Freeduino is for the Qualcomm Adreno uh, GPUs. Uh, Etnaviv is for we wanted GPUs. I think they're more used in their constrained embedded uh, situations, a lot, a lot more on the parrot. Uh, I said it already, uh, Intel kind of abandoned or is, is on track to abandon their, their separate train uh, and is now also writing a, a GL driver using this Gallium framework. So uh, even in user space, we have enormous amounts of code sharing and uh, which, which allows us to kind of re, uh, reverse engineer and develop drivers with ridiculously few people compared to the proprietary uh, teams and in, in fairly little time. And I think one, one thing, one example that's, that, that kind of exemplifies this is uh, AMD was a bit late with their Vulkan driver. Took a quite a bit longer in legal review to get that thing out the door. A bunch of people got bored and figured they learned Vulkan, this shiny new uh, um, 3D and compute graphics API, by just writing a driver. And the thing is now, but with this driver, with just a few people, a few customers between Google and Wolf and Red Hat, uh, reusing all the infrastructure we have shared kind of code to interact with the compositors and, and all the baseline infrastructure, plus all the, this, the compiler infrastructure that we now have. Uh, we now have this RADV uh, Vulkan AMD driver and a uh, new AMD compiler thing called ACO, uh, which is done, yeah, like I said, by one handful of people, really, like about this many, uh, and it's beating AMD. So it's on par or better across the board. And so same story in, in the kernel as in, in user space. We've, we've uh, developed so many help with so much shared code, so much experience as a community uh, that we can uh, develop uh, open source GPU drivers uh, really well and, and cheaply. And we're getting there. So another th other thing, uh, kind of going to with the, the community, the, the moving over to GitLab and V here means mostly user space. The kernel is, is quite lacking. I made a talk last year that for a bunch of kind of infrastructure reasons, we haven't really moved on the kernel side. But Mesa 3D, the, the GL Vulkan project is, is fully embracing merge requests, uh, wiring up, uh, uh, CI so that every merge request gets tested and you can't push broken stuff. And I think just about now, the first hardware CI is getting integrated. So you 
do a merge request and it gets tested, I think on free Arena hardware by in, in, a, in a CI that, that Google is, is paying for. Yeah, like I said, uh, the kernel is stuck in quite a bit of infrastructure work, unfortunately. So hopefully we can get going. On the other hand, it's really nice if the user space people figure this out so we know what works and what doesn't work. Another thing is XTC, our conference, is it has been growing quite a bit and we need to actually reject talks and, and discussion proposals nowadays. And we, they, we're using the same uh, uh, software as, as Plumbers, so that works fairly well. We've done this the first time this year. Uh, and XTC has sponsors now since two years, so another sign that they're kind of growing up, they're no longer like a bunch of board students with, uh, working together with, with a tiny R&D team to do a tech demo of open source graphics might be a real thing. We've been growing up a lot. So it's, it's like lots of great stuff, but um, there's, uh, <laughs> 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 there's, there's a bit of a, an embarrassment. Uh, going on, so uh, I think I, I I need to adjust the talk title once more. Um, I mean, need to look a bit at the elephant in the room because uh, that thing is not working great. And I, I think we need to look. I mean, one side is is uh, Nvidia does create great GPUs, and they do this since since like two decades. Uh, but there's also a few other things going on that, that make it especially hard for kind of uh, a nice open source cross vendor solution to, to work for NVIDIA. And uh, that's this. So <laughs> the thing is, I said Kronos is, is opening up. We have, a, 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 um, we have an open source test suite now for, for Vulkan. We have an open source test suite for GLES on SOCs, and we have an open source test suite for GL, kinda. So th the trouble with GL is it's, it's like over 20 years old, and I would say roughly-ish since 20 years, NVIDIA defines how, how uh, desktop GL works. There's a standard PDF somewhere, and it, it's trying to document all the things, not really succeeding. And for a long time, and that still kind of holds, it's essentially desktop GL is defined by whatever the NVIDIA binary blob does. And even, even with the test suite that Kronos is now doing is, there's, uh, there's two huge limitations on that. One is it's mainly just focused on making sure the new GL4 features are well covered. And the other bit is it's not really caring about the compatibility profile. So in the GL3 uh, years, um, uh, desktop GL was kind of split up. And a lot of the GL1 and GL, well, mostly GL1 features were kind of put into a corner called compatibility profile. But they interact in all kinds of funny ways with, with the new uh, shader features in GL3 and GL4. And the trouble is that a lot of kind of the professional desktop applications for CA, the, uh, for computer aided design and all that stuff, uh, they, they use all that old GL, GL stuff still because they've been written like 20, 30 years ago. But they also want to use the new stuff. And essentially the only driver where they work is the NVIDIA one. So uh, NVIDIA is, is, is owning desktop GL. And, uh, NVIDIA is owning even more anything computer-related with CUDA, which is entirely a, um, an NVIDIA-defined standard. I mean, AMD is trying to do their own thing, and they know that without CUDA support, they, they can't ship their hardware, so they have a transpiler, and it works about as well as a transpiler that kind of the source-to-source -source transformation does. And, and obviously, like, they, they're totally not in the, in the driver's seat. So, 
if, if you kind of want to define, uh, defend high margins, it's great to have high, uh, a great product, of course, but it, it also really helps if you have a, a moat around your great product that, that prevents like other people breaking into it. Now, this is, this is user space, right? So you could say, well, uh, so why is this not better on the kernel? On the, the trouble is a bit that NVIDIA is playing the same thing on the kernel, but with kind of the low level infrastructure. Uh, so let's, let's go through them. Uh, uh, the first one is libgl vendor. So that's the problem that if you try to install the NVIDIA driver, it's going to throw out all the other GL drivers, which is kind of not terribly nice behavior. It didn't matter for a long time because all you bought was NVIDIA anyway. Uh, but nowadays with, with uh, like the, the dual GPU laptops, they, you have both the integrated Intel and NVIDIA. Uh, you kind of need two drivers. And of course, like the open source driver stack has this problem solved. You can install Mesa and you get all the drivers. And so this, this had to be ported, uh, was renamed and, and polished and back shedded by mostly NVIDIA people called GL vendor uh, instead of the Mesa DRI loader and put under a NVIDIA project on GitHub. But I think it's now moving back. So that fight is over. We could have just used the DRI loader and improved that one, I think. Uh, the next one is, is, these are the old slides because this was supposed to read EGL dis, uh, display device. So the entire point of kind of moving, or one of the points of moving kernel mode setting into the, into the or mode setting display drivers into the kernel was that you could some, run something else than X, like Wayland. And NVIDIA's, uh, NVIDIA's display driver is like in, running in user space integrated with X. So when this was about to take off, uh, an NVIDIA engineer came to XTC. We have them quite often there and discussing things. Uh, presenting about EGL display device, like their solution to how to do cross vendor uh, uh, mode setting in an uh, in a, in a, in a X11 agnostic way. And uh, of course, cross vendor means it runs on NVIDIA. But the other problem was also right around that time, we finally got around to merging atomic mode setting to extend uh, the, the graphics subsystem to all these other use cases that we didn't support as far like an embedded for tablets and all these things. And of course, in, uh, <laughs> NVIDIA's EGL display device thing supported nothing like atomic. It was essentially the legacy mode setting API rewritten as an EGL extension. Uh, so that thing fell short because obviously it missed the point. Uh, so the next thing was, well, okay, so we, maybe we can use kernel mode setting, but we have all these special buffer formats, like for our compression engine and all these things. So they abstracted away the entire uh, protocol between uh, a desktop client and the compositor that takes all of the clients together and renders them. Uh, which, of course, like uh, on X11, it's called DRI. Valent has their own versions that work with the open source graphics stuff. And NVIDIA created EGL streams, and they actually insisted so much on that thing that I think GNOME and, and the GNOME Mutter uh, compositor has support for EGL streams because otherwise the NVIDIA blob doesn't work. And meanwhile, uh, we worked on this problem in upstream too and came up with this buffer format modifiers which people then after a few years tried to standardize in some EGL extensions. And I think uh, I I NVIDIA managed to block it for like almost a year because they didn't quite like it. Uh, the next one is redistributable uh, firmware, which is not a problem. You can just reverse engineer it. The newer people have done that. Uh, the, the, the trouble kind of starts once uh, the hardware checks for, uh, for a signature. On, I think on average, that firmware blob in a in a redistribu redistributable license package kind of is a few years late, one two at least. 
which completely took out the steam from that reverse engineering product project. I mean, no one likes to work on software that no, uh, no user can reasonably use because you would need to install the NVIDIA stack, run it once, extract the firmware image, then throw it all out again, and then you can run the open source stack. Oh, I mean, that, that, that's just too painful. But uh, the thing is, I mean, NVIDIA owns the market, and they own it with a great product, but they own it also by just setting the standard. And I would say it would be stupid not to try this, which is like, so what's the business case between, uh, behind open, open GPU drivers? This clearly from NVIDIA's point of view, it doesn't really exist. Uh, but the nice thing of the 10 years of, of really pushing for this really hard is, I think on the customer side, it clearly exists. Um, it exists so much that customers are willing to pay consulting shops to just reverse engineer a driver if they don't get it or hire entire driver teams. Uh, and I, I've, do, I've done a quick count for like current GPU hardware. We have more reverse engineered drivers in, in our <coughs> upstreams now than vendor supported ones. So clearly from a customer point of view, um, the business case exists. Now the trouble is from a hardware vendor point of view, there's three companies. That's Intel, IMD, and Broadcom for Raspberry Pi. And uh, if you want to do like graphics drivers, open source graphics drivers, without uh, the massive pain of reverse engineering, which at least means you're, you're a bit too light, uh, you, you need the hardware vendor support, right? Now the trouble is they have fairly big teams and someone needs to pay the bills. And uh, that kind of leads me to the third title change because, I mean, a bait and flip is only fun if you do it a few times. So we're back to the real talk um, of upstream graphics and, and how well does, does this work if you, if you, if you want to ship product with it. So here's an example, Android by Google. Uh, it takes about half a year from Linux Next to show this, uh, to ch show like a patch service, just ignoring all the review that we need to do before uh, in, in a release, roughly, worst case. Then if you're lucky, or well, if you're really unlucky, it takes another year for this thing to show up in an LTS release, which is generally well, most customers kind of want-ish. And then it takes another year for Google to rebase this. And I think last year there was a great talk about how they celebrated cutting that time down from two to one year. Oh, and, and honestly, that talk was primary motivation for doing this talk here because in this presentation, I celebrated all the milestones about, oh, and at the very end of the talk, there was this, oh, and in the next upgrade, we're totally going to be able to use this feature. And I was like, wait, we merged this three years ago. What's going on here? And the thing is, I mean, uh, Android is kind of the well-known example, but it's, it's, it's the same problem every year. It's, it's the same problem for servers, for, for like embedded, for Android, for anything in between. So you need to support a few years of LTS with your graphics driver if, if you want to like actually sell your, your, your silicon chips. I accept uh, there's no such thing as an LTS because if you actually look at what customers use, uh, occasionally they just miss a line and miss the LTS and don't want to wait a year, so you get another kernel release. Oh, they kind of realized, well, uh, driver's GPU seems to move a bit quicker than the other bits of the kernel, so let's just backport it. So maybe you have an LTS, but driver's GPU, the part I care about, is totally not an LTS. The, the next thing is um, they need to add tons of patches 
Or just today I chatted with someone who's trying to upstream a DRM driver from the vendor tree. I'm cleaned it all nice up. Figured, oh, I should probably boot this and upstream before I submit it. And then realized that uh, the clock driver is not in upstream, and the regular driver is not in upstream, and the I2C driver is not in upstream. So it, it doesn't doesn't really work. So there's there's usually tons of patches and all kind of incompatible with, with what upstream expects. So every everyone's different. So you're a GPU vendor on. You have this nice driver, and you try to ship it, and you've done the right thing. You've done upstream first development, so it, it is in upstream, but it's not anywhere any close to a tree where, where your customers are. So there's a bunch of approaches with this, uh, and one thing this this is kind of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux approach, but I think a bunch of others do it too. It's just you look at drivers GPU, and you stand back in on and say, I don't understand this. I just take it all and plug it into my kernel, and then scream at my kernel until it compiles and ships it. <laughs> um, I think this works great if, if you don't have like a, a, a too bad support contract that you actually, oh, if, if you, if on your team, a lot of the people who did write the upstream stuff work, and so they could maybe debug problems. And I mean, it definitely doesn't really work if you have random other drivers in there, uh, because that random other driver might actually expect the driver's GPU subsystem behavior from the LTS plus patches that it was developed against, and not the LTS plus driver's GPU from 4.3. Oh. So this kind of works-ish, uh, but it has huge problems. Th the next one is, it just say, like, well, I mean, it's a driver. How big can it be? <laughs> and so you end up cherry-picking a thousand patches or something like that from upstream. And, and there's, there's like two approaches here. One is you just say, oh, um, I'm going to cherry pick like a thousand individual patches and make sure I only get the stuff, stuff for the GPU I want. I want to reduce the risk. But of course, this means your driver is a completely new, uh, different driver from the upstream driver, which means you, you, you get to redo all of the validation and all the review because the assumptions of the original patch are kind of out of the window if you don't take all of it. Uh, the other approach is you just copy driver's GPU, but we'll get essentially you take the entire history, including all the merges, and you transplant that entire history with the same merges to your LTS kernel and hope it still works. Because if you don't keep the same merges, all the merge conflicts move around, and you get back to cherry picking a thousand patches. Um, we have done this a few times, mostly for customers who absolutely insist that they won't get commits for everything, and who pay enough to get kit, get commits for everything. <laughs> because I mean, it's, it's, it's not cheap to do this. Um, the other approach that I've also seen is is kind of uh, uh, dr copying drivers GPU, but you copy it and then you rename all the clashing functions and rename uh, the driver module. So do you just have a driver for this module and nothing else in a completely separate DRM subsystem? Oh, it's obviously enormous amounts of work because you really need to make sure that the, uh, the, the distros or, or customers DRM subsystem doesn't like badly interfere with your own copy of the DRM subsystem. So another approach to kind of solve this or DKMS stuff, ah, this, this kind of shared core code problem is you, you make a separate kernel module. You take your upstream driver. This is what AMD does. And, and the cherry picking is what Ian told us, by the way, if we, if we put blame around. Oh, so you take your upstream kernel and you just copy just the driver sources to your 
customer or this row tree. And then every time you use a new or helper function that your downstream kernel doesn't have yet, you write a patch with a few if dafs and the copy pasted version of that, that, uh, that upstream helper uh, to make it all work again. <laughs> so uh, I think in AMD's case, this is like 300 patches that they rebase every time their upstream changes. It's not a thousand, like it's, it's already better. So another approach is you just rage crash and say, oh, I want a stable driver API. And the thing is, this works in user space. So in user space, the, the Mesa 3D uh, project, we, we have stable APIs with the kernel, of course. We have stable APIs, or well, protocols with uh, the compositors. I mean, you mostly manage to not break it. And I think as a general rule of thumb, we keep between three and five years of, of backwards compatibility with old stuff. And the thing is, you can do uh, a Mesa driver and just link in all the helpers and not use kind of the, sh the shared object. So you could even do like a backport of a driver, more or less, uh, without affecting the current driver uh, for, for the current hardware that's already shipping in like the distro or whatever. So with this, you can actually ship random upstream driver snapshot. And I think a, a pretty similar approach is, is the travel, Android's travel project, where they're also trying to compel to, uh, to kind of fence off the drivers against the other stuff and put lots and lots of, of uh, stable uh, APIs uh, around them so that you can upgrade the driver uh, without having to upgrade anything else. Now, of course, uh, Having a stable driver driver API defeats code sharing, and so that would completely defeat the point of upstream. Because uh, kind of going back to to the happy story of how awesome upstream graphics is, uh, you don't achieve a graphics driver in 250 lines without code sharing. So, one approach that might work, I don't think anyone's ever tried this, is to just have a stable subsystem API and essentially make a, each driver module just link in the entire subsystem without any exporting. But uh, getting back to the business case of doing upstream first, I mean, in user space, I think it works. It works rather well uh, for graphics driver. But in the kernel space, it is roughly, so you have your driver, you shepherd it through upstream review, you're a good citizen, you refactor it, you share code, you make sure every, there's, there's nice and clean cross-driver interfaces, shared concepts, uh, shared code, all these helper libraries. And then you have it in upstream. And then you take your upstream driver and you take all the crap that you've thrown out and add it back in because you don't have all these nice helpers in downstream because they're running on some old kernels. And then once you put the crap back in, you, you ship it. And uh, yeah, this sounded like a really good idea 10 years ago when we started. Uh, unfortunately, like with the companies doing upstream first on the kernel, uh, it, it just doesn't work. Um, I've been in quite a lot of meetings where essentially we're justifying upstream first because we're the upstream first team and if you wouldn't do upstream first, it would be kind of embarrassing. But not because it actually makes a whole lot of business sense. So <laughs> why do we do this? Like some customers require upstream first because for the review and the code sharing and the quality and then proceed to ignore upstream. So in, in a way, oh, the Linux kernel, the way I see it, is in a really icky spot. It's too big and too fast to just say, well, forget it. We're going to make a stable API and solve this problem like that. And it's, it's also like too light for actually shipping upstream first. 
And uh, I don't know how to fix this, but I do think if, if we do want upstream GPU drivers open source, we need to somehow figure this out. So that uh, upstream first in the kernel doesn't mean you clean it up, you have a nice driver that doesn't really pay the bills, not at least for your hu huge team. I mean, it did pay the bills like 10 years ago when it was T3 people. Uh, then you add in back all the crap, and then you ship it, because that kind of doesn't work. And I'm not sure we have questions. Uh, time for questions, unfortunately. Yeah, we're running out of time. We, so we can maybe spend five minutes on questions. So your, your last couple slides sound like RDMA, like, exactly, for, we've been living this too, just like GPU, but I think our business case is different, it works a little better, and, and we're really strongly endorsing upstream first, and we are getting the business case value out of it that, that you seem to be lacking, and it's because the customers want it, the customers are willing to pay extra to get it, and we're able to work with the distribution channel, which is like the enterprise Linuxes, um, to do the backports in a coordinated way. We don't have... I don't, I don't know anything about your world, but it sounds like you spend a lot of time talking about Android where it was kind of a big mess. Oh, it's, it's the same everywhere. Well, like I can put a patch in the upstream kernel and I can ship it to a customer in a supported enterprise distro in eight months, tops. And I can get it to them earlier with a, a backport scheme in four months. So I get all the value out of it. Why, why, where do you struggle? Uh, one is that the four months will back, I mean, so one thing is if you backport is like a few, a thousands of patches if, you, if you're unlucky. So it's, it's a bit bigger. And the other thing is, I don't, I don't see eight months. Like, I, I'm not sure how you get, and the other thing, so on the business case, we, like. We, we get eight months because we spend a lot of money working with the commercial distributions to get eight months. That's, that's the end of the story. Yeah, I mean, is, that's is, none of this happens for free, I think. It's, it's an important takeaway. So, you so don't get backports for free. So you don't get any of this stuff for free. There's engineers working on this full time, the, a lot of them. The thing is, if you compare this to user space, we do upstream first in user space, and it works. But, I mean, your user space doesn't come in an enterprise distro for at least another period of time either. You're saying... You can just upgrade it. You're saying you can just a stable upgrade. API. People may or may not accept that. We've also had the same problem in users, our user space where people say, I don't want the open source user space that I just downloaded from the internet. I want the one my distribution is supporting fully. So they won't upgrade either. They want the distribution to put it back. You end up with the user space doesn't solve it either because the serious, serious support wanting customers always want support from their vendor. Always. Well, we have time for one more question. So one of our pain points is the whole backporting thousands of patches with merge commits and just making it all, reassembling it all on top of an older kernel. Part of that is an artifact of the fact that you've chosen to have a development model to optimize productivity to produce the code in the first place. So you have a complex um, merge history and things like that, right, in your subsystem. And that's a valid choice. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But if you chose to trade off some execution on original development and tweaking it so it makes it easier to backport and maintain downstream, what do you think can be done there? Um, I think we managed to get here through this radical co-chairing and refactoring and doing things, both in user space and, and, and the kernel. So I'm not sure we would have managed to to get kind of to the happy place where we can say we, we have really great drivers for a lot of stuff without this. But yeah, now. Can you tweak it now? Does it work, make sense to tweak it now? Um, I don't have answers on this. So, so the trouble, like, like I said, like the, the customer use case or the customer, the customer business case for open source graphics is definitely here. And that's why we have more 
kind of reverse engineered drivers than vendor supported drivers. And if, if we now start to switch, we're going to kill the reverse engineered drivers because they're benefiting in a way from all that refactoring and sharing. It's maybe, yeah. but yeah, so and I guess we're like, out of time, sorry. Yeah, it sounds like we're not going to be able to solve this problem now. So we're entering, we're exiting on such an up note. Uh, but uh, thanks so much to Daniel, and I'm sure we'll be continuing this conversation uh, in the hallways. <laughs>